प्रथम सदगुरु So he was 
rethinking it. He wanted to make sure he was doing the right thing. We see that even before the war began, the difference between Arjun and Duryodhan was highlighted by the Leela, what happened when they went to Dwarika to ask for Sri Krishna's help in the war. Sri Krishna said, I'll help both of you, but since I saw Arjun first, because Arjun was humbly standing at the foot of Krishna's bed when he woke up, whereas Duryodhan was standing by his head like that, Arjun was down by his feet. So he saw Arjun first and he said, uh, you get first pick, I'm giving you two choices. One of you will get my entire army and one of you will get me. The other one gets me and one gets my entire army, but under this condition that I will not raise a weapon in this war. So now Arjun, you choose. And Duryodhan was relieved and he thought Arjun was very foolish when he chose Krishna. Now, unless Arjun knew who Krishna was, who in their right mind, if, they, if someone just thought Krishna, even if they thought Krishna was a great man, not God, if someone just thought he was a man, but a great man, who in their right mind would choose him with no weapon, and not even going to, to fight against anybody in the entire war versus his whole army with millions of warriors. Who in their right mind would make that choice? Only someone who knew who Krishna was. He, Arjun knew he was Bhagwan, and that is why he chose him. And then later on, when Sri Krishna went to Duryodhan personally, like a last-ditch effort to avoid the war. One last peace proposal. One last chance to work things out. Imagine God himself going to a soul and pleading with him, please do the right thing. You know, people say that, uh, well, God is all kind and God is all knowing and all powerful. So why does bad exist in the world? Why does evil exist? The answer is right there in that Leela of Sri Krishna going to Duryodhana. God himself going to someone and say, I'm trying to convince you to do the right thing. Don't do the wrong thing. And not, Duryodhana didn't just uh, disobey or, or ignore Krishna's advice, but he insulted him, he even tried to throw him in jail. At that point, Sri Krishna even revealed his almighty form to Duryodhana. He revealed his divine almightiness right there in front of him. And Duryodhana just said, oh, he's some kind of magician showing some tricks. Catch him and throw him in jail. See, what can God do? If a soul is not willing to accept the right thing, what can God do? All he can do is guide and, and try to help us go in the right direction. But the rest is up to us. So we were at the point now where the war was about to begin and then Arjun decided that he wanted to rethink things one more time. Why was Arjun confused? We're going to see in this chapter. But uh, Krishna starts talking now and he explains to Arjun in a few different ways from a couple different perspectives why he should fight the war. The first perspective is called the Sankhya perspective. Sankhya philosophy tells us who we are. That we are not this physical body. We are the divine soul. It's a very simple fact. But Arjun needed to understand this fact. Arjun, you could say in his uh, as he was behaving, as he was acting, he was acting as an agyani. Agyani means an ignorant person. And who is ignorant? The one who doesn't even know who he is. Who are we? If, uh, if anyone asks us, can you please uh, give me your introduction, tell me who you are? We always start with our name. But the question wasn't, what do people call you? 
The question was, who are you? So it shows, we don't even know who we are. We're giving some name that our parents or our Pandit Ji assigned to us at the beginning of this birth. But in our previous birth, we were called something else. And the birth before that, something else. And even if you get married in this life, a woman may change her name again. So what's a name? That's not who you are. Okay, okay, I'm not my name. Who am I? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a doctor. I'm a teacher. I'm a lawyer. I'm an engineer. That's your job. I'm not asking what you do. I'm asking who you are. Okay, who am I? I'm, uh, I'm Punjabi. I'm Gujarati. <laughs> I'm Canadian. I'm American. I'm not asking where you were born. I want to know who you are. Okay, okay. I am a human being. You're still only describing your physical body. You could have been an ant in your last life. <laughs> We've been born in all the species. When uh, Shukdev Ji Maharaj, when he was in his mother's womb, Pingla Devi's womb, for 12 years, he didn't come out. So his father, Veda Vyas, after 12 years, he was thinking, enough is enough. What is he doing in there? <laughs> hey, what are you doing in there? And who are you staying in your mother's womb for 12 years? Who are you? So Shukdev Ji said, Father, I have been I have been born in every species, in uncountable lifetimes. What can I tell you? Who am I? So we can't identify ourselves as the actual body, yet we do. We do identify ourselves as the body. We say, I'm fat, I'm skinny, I'm beautiful, I'm ugly, I'm tall, I'm short. No, you're not. Your body is. This body is just a vehicle. Just like you probably drove here in a car, many of you, so that car is a vehicle for you to get around in. Similarly, this physical body is nothing more than a vehicle for our soul, which is our true identity. So who am I? I am Atma. I am the soul. That is the correct answer. But we're all in this same boat as Arjun. Meaning, even if we know this fact intellectually, we don't practically our con that, that fact is not in our consciousness throughout the day. Throughout the day, we're not thinking, I am the soul, I am the soul, I am the soul. No, no, we actually think of ourselves as the body. When you look at your car, you don't get confused about your identity. You don't say, I am red, I have four doors. <laughs> I have an automatic transmission. You know that that's the car. You, you don't think that I am the car. Then why do we get confused and think I am the body? It's nothing more than a vehicle like the car. So that's a basic ignorance. And this ignorance Arjuna had. So Sri Krishna started by clearing up this basic fundament, fundamental fact. Natvevaham jatunasam natvam neme janadhipa. Hey Arjun, you, me, all of them, all of this, there never was a time when we weren't in existence, and there never will be a time when we will cease to exist. So, He's referring to the three eternal tattva, which are mentioned in the Vedas. Bhokta bhogyam preritaran jamatva sarvam proktam trividham brahmame tat. There are three things that exist. God, the souls, and maya. Maya means the world. Just three things. God and the world, and then the souls who live in the world. And some souls who are God-realized who live with God in the divine world. But souls, souls can exist in one of those two states. Either in a state of 
divine bliss with God in the divine world, or here in this world, under the bondage of Maya. But souls are souls, whether they're God-realized or whether they're under the bondage of Maya, like we are, souls are still souls. A soul doesn't become God after God-realization. If that happened, you would cease to exist after God-realization. Like a river merges into the ocean. The river ceases to exist at that point. That water of the river that enters into the ocean is no longer called the river. It's now called the ocean. So the river ceases to exist because it became part of the ocean. If a soul actually became God, that means that soul ceases to exist. But it doesn't happen that way. Because na sato vidyate bhavo na bhavo vidyate sata Shri Krishna tells Arjun that an, an existing thing can just cease to exist. And if something doesn't exist, it can't be brought into existence. You might say, well, there are so many inventions, new technologies being brought into existence every day. Yes, but those aren't being created out of nothing. We're taking some material and working with that to make something else like going to the beach and building a sand castle. You don't make the sand, you just form it into something, some kind of form. When you uh, bake a cake, you took the ingredients, flour and sugar and butter and milk, all these things, you didn't invent them, you just recombined them in a new way and you made something. So nothing can be created or destroyed. That's what Shri Krishna is saying, not in its essential form. The forms of this universe can be created or destroyed, but not the original energy. Like your sand castle on the beach can be washed away by a wave, but the sand isn't destroyed. So the essential energy of the world is called Maya. This whole world can be dissolved back into an absolutely subtle energy. But the energy is still there. It doesn't cease to exist. And when God reactivates that energy, then it unfolds into this visible physical universe that we see now. But it's the same energy that was there in that subtle dormant form. It's the same thing. So that's Maya. That's one thing that exists. Souls are the second thing. And God is the third thing. So a simple philosophy, Shri Krishna tells him, God, the souls, and Maya, these things have always existed, and they always will exist. Dehino sminyatha dehe kaumaram yauvanam jara he says, Arjun, because your body is made of maya, so it can degrade. Because like I was saying, you can take sand and make a castle. Eventually that castle is going to fade away. It's going to crumble and get washed away. Similarly, your body was formed at a certain point. And then it passes through certain stages, like birth, then it grows, it becomes young, it matures, reaches the peak of its strength, and then it starts declining, you get old age. Eventually the body returns right back to the earth. So the body goes through these changes, but not the soul. This is the main point he's making. Differentiate between the body and the soul. The body is born and dies. Jātasya hi dhruvo mrityur dhruvam janma mritasya ca Whatever is born must die, and whatever dies is reborn again. Meaning, uh, your body, when it decomposes, it's reborn in another form. Those same elements are incorporated into the form of something else. But then that something else will die as well. 
So material forms are born and die. Not the original energy of, that's a constant. So your body is a form which appeared, meaning it was born, it was created, and it will die one day. But your soul was never created and it will never die. Ajo nitya shashvato yam purano nahanyate anyamane sharire. Because your soul is not killed by the physical death of your body. Nainam chindanti shastrani nainam dhati pavaka Nachainam kledayantyapo nasho shayati maruta The soul can't be killed or harmed by any material thing. It can be cut by any weapon. It can be made wet. It can be dried out. It can be burnt. So the soul cannot die. The body is killed. The soul cannot be killed. Basan Sijiraniyatha Vihaya Navani Grihnati Naruparani Tatha Sharirani Vihaya Jirnan Nyanyani Sanyati Navani De Just like you change your clothes, your soul changes bodies. That's it. It's just a transition for the soul when the physical body dies. It's not the death of you. You never die. So Krishna's point is, Arjun, the, the root of your confusion is that you're afraid that your relatives and your loved ones will die. So I'm telling you, they can't die. You may kill their body, but you have no power to kill their soul, and they have no way of killing you. But why to worry about killing someone's body? Meaning, what Krishna is saying is not to indiscriminately go, go around doing such things. He's saying when the situation calls for it, such as the situation with which Arjun was faced, so at that point, why fear something which is inevitable anyway? All these people were guaranteed to die at the time they were born. You're, you're not doing something that wasn't going to happen anyway. Everybody dies. So don't make that a reason not to do the right thing, that you're fearing their death or your death. You can't die, they can't die, only their body can die, and their body is going to die anyway, whether you fight the war or don't fight the war. And in fact, Sri Krishna shows Arjun later in the 11th chapter that all of these warriors' time is up. Arjun, whether you fight this war or not, most of these warriors are going to die. Their time has come. Meaning, their physical body's time has come. So, don't choose not to fight the war out of such a fear of physical death. Arjun is listening. He's still not convinced. He didn't pick up his bow and get up and say, okay, let's go. Let's, let's fight this war. So, Sri Krishna kept talking. He explained it from another point of view. That was the Sankhya point of view. <clears throat> Next he says, Hato va prapsya se svargam jitva va bhokchya se mahim tasma duttishtha kanteya yudhaya krita nishchaya. Now he's explaining it to him from a karma point of view. Karma means right and wrong. The Sankhya 
point of view he gave was understanding who you are. You are not the physical body, you are the soul. Now he's explaining from a simple right and wrong perspective. Arjun, fighting this war is the right thing to do because it's your duty. Now someone may say, well that sounds like a pretty horrible duty. Why is that his duty? Why is fighting a war the right thing to do? And the answer is quite simple if you look at Arjun's uh, position as being similar to a modern day police officer. A police officer has to uphold the law. That's his duty. In order to uphold the law, he can use force, but it's a last resort, obviously. He doesn't go around looking for a reason to draw his gun, but it's there if he needs it. If, some, if a criminal is perpetrating a crime and he's not stopping when the police officer says, police, stop, and he's threatening someone else, the police officer can use force. He may even kill that criminal. In fact, if he doesn't use force, the police officer will be held accountable. You just watched so that he didn't listen to you when you said stop, and you say, oh, okay, what more can I do? No, you have to take the next step as a police officer and use force to uphold the law if necessary. So Arjun, with Krishna's help, had tried all the alternatives to find the police a peaceful solution. But it was not an option to just let Duryodhan go on the way he was. Duryodhan was an example of wrongdoing at that time. He had to be stopped, he had to be put in his place. Arjun had to uphold dharma and uphold the laws of the society and in order to do that, he had to stop Duryodhan. And Duryodhan he said in his own words, I'm not stopping. You have to fight me in a war. That's the only way. If you defeat me in a war, then you'll succeed. Otherwise not. So Arjun had no choice. It was the right thing for him to do, to fight this war at this point. So Sri Krishna says, fighting the war is your dharma. It's your duty. If you don't do your duty, you will be punished. That's the law of karma. Doing your duty, fulfilling your responsibilities is good karma. You'll be rewarded for that in your next life. And if you shirk your duty, if you ignore it or avoid it, then you'll be punished because that's a bad action. In other words, he's using this incentive of it's a good thing, Arjun, so do the good thing and you'll be rewarded. Rewarded with what? He says, well, either way, whether you're, whether you're killed in the war or whether you win the war, either way you win if you choose to do the right thing. Because if you win the war, then you'll be king and you'll enjoy the pleasures of kingship. And if you lose the war, you'll be rewarded by going to Swar because a warrior fighting a righteous war who's killed, he goes to Swat. And in your next birth as well, you'll be rewarded with more prosperity. So if you do your duty, you don't even have to worry whether you're killed or not. You're doing the right thing, so you will be rewarded. Therefore, Arjun, get up and decide to fight this war. But, See, what, is, what incentive is Krishna giving Arjun here? The incentive of worldly pleasure. If you do good, you will be rewarded with more worldly pleasure, even, either in this life, or in the next life, or in Swarga. But Arjun has already said, Nakaan che vijayam Krishna na charajyam sukhani cha Krishna, I don't desire the pleasures of kingship. I don't even want to be, become famous or, or known as a great warrior. That, oh, Arjun conquered in the Mahabharata war. I don't have that kind of personal ambition. He's already stated that in the first chapter. So in other words, 
worldly enjoyment is not, it's not an incentive for Arjuna. In fact, Sri Krishna himself condemned worldly enjoyment previously in this second chapter. He gave some understanding about the pleasures of this world. When I say condemned, I mean as far as them being real happiness. He said no. Matra sparshastu kaunteya shitoshna sukhadukhada Talking about the worldly existence, he said that the world is always full of these pairs of opposites, like heat and cold, pleasure and pain, day and night, life and death, summer and winter, dry and wet, all these, all these pairs of opposites form the, the substantial nature of this world, it's just how the world is. And these opposites keep oscillating. Meaning that heat doesn't last forever. Heat gives way to cold. But then the cold doesn't last forever. Cold later gives way to heat. Pleasure doesn't last forever. Eventually you get some pain. And pain doesn't last forever. Eventually you get some more pleasure. This is the nature of the world. Neither the positive things nor the negative things exist forever in a stable way. One keeps giving way to the other like a cycle. So then how can we ever hope to find lasting happiness in such a world where nothing lasts? No relationship lasts forever because no one lives forever. No possession lasts forever no matter how much happiness it gives you. Nothing lasts forever. He revealed more about the nature of worldly happiness when he said, Na sato vidyate bhavo, na bhavo vidyate sata. There's a, a deep philosophy in this line. What exists cannot cease to exist. If it's a fact, it remains a fact forever. Like I told you, God is a fact. So God was never created, and God can never be destroyed. He exists as an eternal fact. Souls are an eternal fact. And Maya is an eternal fact. The energy of Maya has existed forever, and no one, even God, can destroy Maya. He can eliminate the bondage of Maya for an individual soul who surrenders to him. But that's like getting released from jail, but the jail is still there. So Maya is still there even if you were released from Maya. In this way, an eternally existing fact is stable. It's truth. What this means applied to worldly happiness is that if something, if there is real happiness in this world, then it should be stable. It should be a fact and remain as a fact. But that's not the case with worldly happiness. Whatever you can enjoy in this world, the enjoyment has a lifespan. Let's say you're enjoying eating something. How long do you keep enjoying it? For as long as you're hungry. Once your hunger is finished, your enjoyment of eating that food also finishes. You can't keep eating the same thing. Even your favorite food, the best tasting thing in the whole world for you. Start eating it, and the more you eat, the less enjoyment you get. If you're looking at it as a graph, the, the moment you started eating, that's the, the peak of your enjoyment was there. And as time keeps increasing, meaning you keep eating, you eat more and more, the enjoyment goes down and down and down and down until it reaches zero. Why? Because your desire was decreasing. The more you ate, the more satisfied your desire was until your desire became zero. You no longer have any hunger. That means now 
that there's no pleasure in eating. In fact, if someone made you keep eating after you reached that point, the very thing that was giving you pleasure is now going to start giving you displeasure. So ask yourself, is there real happiness in food? You say, well, I get happiness from the food. But was there happiness in the food? Could we list that as an ingredient in the food? That in this food, there's flour, there's water, there's sugar, and there's 10 grams of happiness. <laughs> no, we couldn't list it. Because if there was 10 grams of happiness in that food, you should be able to eat and keep eating that food. Just like, <coughs> let's say if they say, let's say you have a box of crackers. In every cracker, there's five calories. So you go on eating the crackers, you go on getting five calories every time you eat a cracker. It doesn't, the calories don't disappear at a certain point. So if there was happiness in that food, you should be able to go on eating it and keep getting the same amount of happiness. But it doesn't happen because the happiness isn't a substantial fact that exists in the food. The happiness exists in here. You had a desire, so your mind experienced happiness. It wasn't a real thing, you just imagined it in your mind. Same thing with water. If you're really thirsty, drinking water gives you happiness. But how many liters will you drink? Maximum probably one liter if you're really thirsty on a really hot day. After that, no one keeps drinking two, three liters of water at once. Well, the same water will make you sick if you keep drinking it. It's the same thing with beauty. There's no happiness in beauty. The happiness is in here. You may say, no, 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 when I look at a beautiful person, I feel very happy. Okay, take the most beautiful person in this world. Whoever you think it is, Shah Rukh Khan, Aishwarya Rai. Let's, let's say we could get them here and I put you in a room with them and said, okay, now stare at this person's face and don't look away. You're not allowed to look away. Keep looking at their face non-stop. How long will you keep receiving pleasure from that? In the beginning, you'll be amazed. Oh, I never saw someone so beautiful. It's so, I feel so happy looking at them. Eventually, though, you'll get bored. Your eyes get used to it. It's a scientific fact that uh, if you keep giving the same stimulus to your brain, the nerves in the brain stop reacting in the same way. The, uh, scientists can measure that, that uh, happy reaction in your brain. You know, when you get something or see something or taste something that makes you happy, if they have you hooked up to the electrodes, the scientists can see, oh, see that area of his brain? It reacted because he's happy, he's receiving pleasure. But if you keep giving the exact same stimulus, the scientists will see that in that area of the brain, I gave the same amount of stimulus and there was less reaction. His brain is getting used to it. His brain is getting bored. Now you need a larger stimulus to get the same reaction. We all experience that. We get bored of everything. We get bored of looking at the same face for hours on end. We get bored of our car. When you buy a new car, it's exciting for a few weeks. Then you get bored of it. You get bored of your house. Kids get bored of their toys, their video games. Everybody wants something new. Because there's no happiness in that thing. The happiness is the excitement our brain feels when we get a new thing. That's it then we need a change to get the same experience. So it's all an excitement of the brain. It's not an actual happiness, which is a truth existing in that thing. If happiness existed as a fact in the people or objects of the world, then everybody could keep enjoying the same happiness from the same thing. In other words, if one person liked onions, everybody would like onions. If one person got five units of happiness out of eating onions, 
everybody on this whole earth planet would get the same five units of happiness from eating onions. But some people really dislike onions, and some people really like them. Because it depends on the mind. Take another example of a person. If there were happiness in beauty, then why would a mother, let's say a mother has lost her child at a, at a mela in a big crowd, and she goes to the police station and says, I lost my child. Okay, ma'am, can you please describe your child to me and we'll see if uh, we found him. And as she describes, it becomes obvious to the police officer that, uh, you know, her child is not beautiful to look at. Maybe the child is deformed or crippled. There's something to look physically. The child is not beautiful. So the police officer says to her, well, we have some other children here that have been found. And from your description, it seems like these children are much more beautiful than your child. So why don't you choose one of these and take them home? The mother says, no. I don't care about the beauty, I want my child. So why does her child give her happiness and not the other beautiful children? Because she's not attached to those beautiful children. She's attached to her child. If your child has been away at school for eight months at university and comes back after eight months, you will be very excited. You'll probably tell all your neighbors, maybe throw a party. So your neighbors may come out of formality, but they're not happy to see your child. <laughs> they would be happy to see their child. So why? If there was happiness in that person, if happiness actually existed in your child, everybody in this whole world, even a perfect stranger, should be able to experience the same happiness looking at your child as you do. But it doesn't work. You get the happiness based on the attachment. More attachment, more happiness. Less attachment, less happiness. And then the opposite happens. If you lose an object or a person that you're attached to, you get an equal amount of pain. If, a, if someone's child dies, you get the grief. Your neighbor who has no attachment to your child will also come as a formality and express their regret but they're not feeling bad inside because they have no attachment to your child. So attachment results in the pleasure or the pain that we experience in this world. But as Vishnu Purana says, there is not a drop of actual happiness or unhappiness in this whole world. Naiva kinjit sukhat makam. Not even a, a fraction, an iota of real happiness, sukh, or unhappiness, dukh, in this whole world. It's just an experience we get in here based on our desire or our attachment. When we desire something and we get it, and we get that much happiness. But then as we go on enjoying it, our desire becomes satiated. So the enjoyment fades and eventually finishes. And depending on our attachment to a person or thing, we get that, that much happiness in meeting and pain in separation. So Shri Krishna explained all of this with just a couple of simple verses. In other words, the incentive he's giving to Arjuna is not much of an incentive at all. Do your duty and you'll enjoy the world. Enjoy the world? Krishna, you just finished telling me that there's no real enjoyment in this world. It's all in my head. Later on in the chapter, Sri Krishna says, Dhyayato vishayan punsa sangasteshu pajayate sangat sanjayate kama kamat krodho bhijayate. He describes what happens when a person looks for happiness from any worldly thing. He says that you start dwelling on that thing. 
Actually, it's a form of meditation. This thing or this person could give me happiness. That's what we do. Because we're looking for happiness, it's normal and natural to desire happiness. And most people, because they see the world, so they decide, they make that decision. I'm going to look for happiness from this thing or from this person. So then what happens, Krishna describes a cycle that happens. You desire it, then one of two things will happen. You will succeed or you will fail. So if you succeed in getting the object of your desire, like I was just describing, you get some kind of temporary pleasure. It doesn't last forever, though. So your desire is temporary, temporarily satiated. You get that excitement of enjoying that thing, that person's association or that possession, that thing you own. But then what happens? Is your desire satisfied forever? No. He says, out of that comes greed, love. So you desired something, you got it, that's not the end of it. The same desire comes back, stronger than ever. He gives an example that worldly desire is like a fire. And Fulfilling the desire is like pouring ghee on it. The desire can't be satisfied forever by fulfilling it. It doesn't seem to make logical sense, yet we experience that every day. Has anyone ever enjoyed something to the point where they never desired it ever again? It doesn't work that way. If you love chocolate, and you eat chocolate to your heart's content today, does that mean you're not going to desire it tomorrow? No, you will. According to the science I was talking about earlier, you'll need more chocolate tomorrow to experience the same amount of happiness you had today. Because your brain becomes accustomed to that much stimulus. So you now you need more of the same thing to enjoy the same amount of happiness. So that's why we get agreed for more Whatever it is, whether it's money, whether it's fame, name, power, more is never enough. We want more and more and more. So desire doesn't end. Worldly desires never end. There's not one case in the history of this world of someone who enjoyed to the extent that they reached the limit of enjoyment, where they said, I don't need any more enjoyment. This is the limit. In fact, if I, I think if I enjoy any more, it won't be enjoyable. No, we all want to enjoy more. Our desires never end. Jasa jasa sura sa badan barhava ta sudugun kapiru padikava. Just as Surasa made her mouth as big as Hanumanji to try to swallow him, seeing that Hanumanji expanded his body twice as big. So then Surasa made her mouth bigger. And they went on doing this. In the same way, you can give more and more. To fulfill your desires, yet your desires will never give up. They'll never get tired. Krishna Karunayate. Shankaracharya says, You and your body may get old and tired, but your desires remain ever young. Your desires are even stronger than they were when you were young. Pouring ghee on the fire makes the fire burn brighter, it doesn't put it out. In the same way, fulfilling a material desire just makes that desire come back stronger than ever. Girir mahan girir abdhir mahan abdhir nabho mahat nabhaso piparam brahma tato pyasha duratyaya Desires are even greater than God. Vedabhyasji says, 
It says a mountain is great, but there's something greater than a mountain, the ocean, because the ocean is even bigger than a mountain. But the sky, the, the space, is even greater than the ocean. It's bigger. But of course, God is even bigger than that, because this whole universe, it dissolves into one pore of God's body during Mahaprabhu. Yet, desires, worldly desires are said to be even greater than God because a soul can attain God, but you can never fulfill your worldly desires. They just go on growing and growing forever. So this is the cycle of desire. You desire, you get it, you enjoy it, and then the desire comes back, and you need more of the same. And it goes on forever, never to end. But what happens if you don't get what you want? Then, growth. We get angry. So then does the desire finish? No. The desire comes back again, or we just change the field. We, de we decide to desire something else in this world. So desires don't end. And they always either lead to greed or anger, and then more desire. So it's a cycle. Sri Krishna explained all of this in the second chapter, yet he's telling Arjuna, fight the war because it's your dharma. You'll be doing a good action, so you'll be rewarded by more worldly pleasures. So Arjuna's thinking, I wasn't born yesterday. <laughs> you, you can't fool me. That's no incentive for me. I don't, I don't want the enjoyments of this world. Okay, what about swara? Don't you want to enjoy swara? Shri Krishna has already said, Te tam bhukva svarg lokam vishalam chirne punye martya lokam vishanti evam trai dharma manuprapanda gata gatam kama kama labhante yami mam pushpitam vacham pravadantya vipaschita vedava darata parth nanyatrasya drati vachit he says those who desire swarga are even bigger fools wow good incentive if you do your dharma, you'll get to go to swarg. And Ved also says, Pramurha, for the one who strives for swarg. Mur means a fool. Pramur means a great fool, a fool's fool. That's what Ved is saying, and this is what Gita is saying for the one who strives to go to swarg and enjoy over there. Even though Ved says, the enjoyments over there are millions of times greater than the enjoyments here. Bhukva Vishalam, Krishna says, the enjoyments are amazing, extensive, yet they're only temporary. They're also only mayak. So enjoying over there only further multiplies your desires. Even while you're over there, you can be jealous of someone who has more enjoyments than you do. And you also know that it's temporary. It's going to end, and you're going to come back here and start again. Because you earned your stay over there based on how many good actions you performed here. So that runs out eventually, and you come back. So what's the use of that? Yet, this is the incentive Krishna gives to Arjuna. He says, you'll go to Swarg, or you'll enjoy on this earth, but both are just mayak pleasures which never can satisfy you permanently. It's not real happiness. So Krishna knew Arjun was not satisfied by this description. So he told him one more thing. Karmanyevadhikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana ma karma phalahe turbhur Mate Sangostva Karmani. Here he introduces Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga is very simple. 
do the physical duty without the desire to be rewarded with worldly pleasures or without the desire to be rewarded by going to swar. Just do it because it's the right thing to do and have your mind attached to God, knowing that God is perfect happiness. So, in other words, change your aim. Although your aim was always for happiness, but he always directed that desire towards the world, that the world will make me happy. So now change that goal towards God. Desire happiness from God because he is perfect happiness. And while keeping the mind attached to God, because you are always attached to the thing that you desire, while maintaining your attachment of your mind to God, physically do the right thing. Perform your dharma physically. Yesterday I told you that there are two kinds of dharma, aparadharma and paradharma. One is physical dharma, how to be a good person in the world. And one is spiritual dharma, how to attain God. Both are part of our sanatan dharma. But one only leads to worldly enjoyments. If someone is just doing aparadharma, meaning all the physical responsibilities and duties, then they'll be rewarded in this world, but that means they're still bound under maya. And they're limited by the temporary and fleeting nature of worldly happiness. Paradharma leads to perfect happiness because it leads to God realization. So you can do both. That's karma yoga. Physically do your duty in the world and mentally love God, desire God. So he said, do this, Arjun. Don't have a desire for your personal gain that you're going to get from fighting this war but nonetheless fight it, because it's the right thing to do. But while doing so, keep your mind attached to me. That's it. We do this kind of thing all the time in the world. Normally not towards God, though. We do it towards our families. You are attached to your family, and you physically do your work in the world. Meaning, the attachment is in one place, and your physical action is in another place. Let's say you're an accountant or a computer programmer. Are you, are you attached to those ones and zeros that you're programming into the computer? Not at all. It's your work. It's what you do. Your attachment is in your family. So it's possible to have your attachment in one place, but still do a good job in the other place. If you're a computer programmer or an accountant, you do it properly and carefully, even though you're not attached to it. So if we approach all of our worldly duties in the same way, even our duty towards our family, according to the Gita, it's meant to be approached in that way. That do your best possible job. Do your, make the best possible effort to fulfill your family responsibilities but without attachment in the world, even in your family. Your attachment should be in God. This is Karma Yoga. This is Karma Yoga the Gita. It's the only way that a person can physically live in the world and keep their mind in God, if they're actually desiring God and attached to God. So he introduces this concept in the second chapter. It's the solution to Arjun's problem. Why was Arjun confused? Due to his attachment. He was attached to the people he was going to fight against. But returning to our um, initial comparison, comparing, to Arjun, comparing Arjun to a police officer, is that police officer supposed to change what he's doing depending on whether the one breaking the law is a family member or not? No. In fact, he'll be punished if he does, if he, if he gives special treatment to a family member or a loved one. So why should Arjun treat his family any differently? They're on the wrong side. It doesn't matter if he's Bhishma Pitama. It doesn't matter if he's Dronacharya or Kripacharya. 
Whatever their reason was, they chose the wrong side. When Krishna is on one side, the other side is the wrong side. <laughs> it's clear cut. And even from a just a right and wrong perspective, if you're supporting Duryodhan, whatever the reason, you're wrong. So even though they were good people, and they were his relatives, yet they were on the wrong side of the law, literally. They were on the <laughs> wrong side of the law. So Arjun just had to enforce the law and uphold dharma, regardless of who, he, who was going to fight against him. In other words, he can't back down just because his own family members chose to support uh, someone like Duryodhan. If they choose to back down, that's, that's fine, but he cannot choose to back down. And the reason that he was considering that is because, simply because of his attachment. So you see that attachment and duty do not help each other. We think, oh, how can I care for my children if I'm not attached to them? Teachers do it. Teachers care for your children at school, but they're not attached to them. If your child is hospitalized, the doctor and the nurse care for your child, but aren't attached to them. In fact, our attachment most of the time gets in the way. We see that a teacher has training, you know, how to behave with the kids, how much discipline to enforce, how much affection to give when, what kind of support to give them, how to get them to follow the rules. And they do it in a premeditated way, in a, in a measured way, and it works. They have methods, and they follow those methods, and it works. And as parents, what do we do? We lay down the law, we say, if you do this, this will be the consequence. And then our child breaks the rule, but then we don't like to see them unhappy, so we don't enforce the consequence. So then our child will freely break the rule again. So what stopped us from enforcing the, the rule that we had set out? Our own attachment to our child. Attachment gets in the way of doing duty. Because you're not attached doesn't mean that you won't show affection to someone who needs it. Doesn't mean you won't be compassionate. But in order to do our duty properly, we can't be attached in the area where of responsibility. We're supposed to have our attachment in God. And then, then we can function with a clear mind in our area of responsibility. A judge would not be allowed to rule in a case where one of his family members was involved because he's attached and that attachment will cloud his judgment. A doctor will not operate on his own child because he knows his attachment will cloud his abilities. So it's not only possible to fulfill all of our responsibilities without attachment, but it's a requirement. The more attached we are, the less successful we will be in fulfilling our responsibilities. So this is why Gita says, do your duties without attachment. <coughs> but you will have attachment somewhere. That attachment will be in God. So this is karmio. Love God and do your duty in the world. So we didn't quite get to finish the topics of the second chapter because there's one more thing that Arjun asked. He said, that one who follows your advice, Krishna, and he attains God, he becomes thita pragya, which means his mind is perfectly established in you, Krishna. What is that person like? Can you describe them to me? How do they walk? How do they talk? How do they sit? So how Krishna answered this question, we'll see tomorrow, as well as two other questions that Arjuna asked in the third chapter, when he said, What's better, karma yoga or karma sannyas? And the other question, why do we do wrong things when we know it's wrong, but we go ahead and do it anyway? So we'll see how Sri Krishna answered these questions tomorrow. So we'll take a little bit of time for questions now if anyone wants to ask anything. Yes. When, when you're saying that 
there's no happiness in a thing. Because if there was, then everyone in the world would feel the same life of that thing. I was thinking then, happiness is within Bhagwan uh, Sri Krishna. Then why doesn't everyone know him as God and love him as God? So that's a, that's a good point. Happiness does exist as a truth, as a substantial fact in God. That, that real happiness we're looking for does exist in Krishna. And since he's omnipresent, you could say like, I just drank water, which is pervaded by Krishna, who is divine bliss. So technically, I just drank divine bliss, yet I didn't experience any happiness from it. Meaning, I got a certain amount of happiness, whatever material happiness you can get by drinking water, but I didn't experience unlimited divine bliss, even though I just drank it. Right now we're all breathing divine bliss, because Krishna pervades the air which we're breathing, and we're not experiencing it. Why? Because that's divine bliss, and our means of experiencing anything right now is our mind, which is material. So our material mind can know and experience material things. You can say it's like if, uh, you know how ants are expert at finding sugar. If you take some, uh, sugar granules and mix it in some soil, the ant can go in there and extract the sugar and leave the soil behind. So let's say you take a little ant and you put a clump of salt in her mouth and then you have this big mound of sugar and you say here you go go onto the mound of sugar but you just stuffed her mouth full of salt and let her climb around on that mound of sugar for a while and then ask her what did you what did this mountain of white taste like to you oh that was a mountain of salt what are you talking about it's a mountain of sugar why are you telling me it's a mountain of salt well, it tasted like salt to me. Why? Because she couldn't taste the sugar. She had her cheek full of salt. Try it sometime. If you have salt, that much salt in your mouth, you can't taste the sweetness of anything. Similarly, our mind and senses are made of maya. They're impregnated by maya. So even when we're drinking divine bliss, we can't experience it. We only experience Maya. We can't see God. All we see is a white wall. Yet Krishna is there. Why can't we see Him? Because our eyes are material. It's like someone who has jaundice. He'll look at that white wall and he'll tell you with full conviction that that wall is yellow. Yet it's not yellow, it's white. So there's a defect in his senses. Because of that defect, he's projecting that yellow color, or it appears yellow to him, even though it's not. Similarly, even if we saw God standing before us, like when Krishna went to Duryodhana, we would not see God. Because our mind is infected with maya, just like having that jaundice problem. You see everything in a wrong way. We see the whole world as material. And even if God came to us, we would see Him as material as well. Even though He is divine, and even though He's omnipresent in this world, we don't see Him at all. <coughs> so, the only way to experience Him is to get God realized. You have to practice this karma yoga, meaning getting your mind attached to Krishna. That will purify your material mind, and when it becomes... 100% pure, then he will divinize it. He'll make your mind divine. Then you can see him. Then the whole world will be the form of divine bliss for you. So we have to get to that point. What is the nature of that happiness when we attach ourselves to Krishna? Is it contentment, peace? What is it? Yes. It is. Contentment, peace, satisfaction, joy, all of that. But on the, it's a different way than what we experience those same things in the world, meaning from a worldly thing, if we get some joy. That's more of an excitement of the brain cells. 
a temporary excitement. Whereas the devotional happiness we get when we attach our mind to Krishna, that's a deep soul contentment. It doesn't stay for a long time, not even that. When we feel something for God, mm -hmm. it stays, we, we know that it gives us happiness, but then it fades, it goes away too. It doesn't stay, it doesn't last. That's, be, that's only because our mind goes back to the world. Our mind is enjoying the devotional happiness as long as it's attached to God. And then due to our current worldly attachments, our mind gets drawn back into those worldly thoughts. So that's why, that's like an interruption. But then if we come back to God, we can experience more. You said that there are basic three things eternal, right? Krishna, and Maya, and souls. The souls in the pure form, they are very souls. So how they got into the Maya, and why they got into the In the beginning we're talking about. They never got into Maya. Otherwise, then we would have a valid complaint to Krishna. <laughs> You put us in this maya? What's the matter with you? What were you thinking? <laughs> but he never put us here. We're eternally under maya. Simple answer, hard to accept. We're eternally under maya. How do we escape? We can escape by surrendering to Krishna. By becoming God-realized, you escape maya. But we, it's not like we were ever free from maya and then one day maya let go. It's not like that. Anadi kaal se lagi hui hai. When you say a touch in your mind, I'm sorry. So basic thing, the impure souls were there in the beginning. Yes, we've always had this impurity because even we've always had our mind, which is mayak and which is full of impurities. You know, all of our past karma are stored here. So. We're, yes, although the soul itself is not impure, but because it's enveloped by the mind and joined with the mind, so that you can say the mind itself is a form of bondage because the mind is mayak. So until our mind becomes divine, we can't be free from the mind. And the only way to make it divine is to attach it to God. Uh, I'll come to you next. When you say attach your mind to God, it means like whenever you realize that you are thinking some other thing is of God, I'm about to say this. Yes, in your free time you could do that, and if uh, if you have to be thinking of something else for your work or, or something, then you are consciously thinking of that other thing, but your desire is still for God, you know, that should be the aim of your life. Yes. So, uh, to break the bondage of karma, you gotta um, love God. That's right. And is God, is Krishna alive? Is Krishna what? Alive. Alive? Alive. Oh, a light. What did light. 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 light? light. Um. By that, do you mean is he just a formless energy? Is that what, what you're asking? Yeah, formless light. No. No, that, that formless, uh, divine radiance, which we call formless God, is just the radiance of Krishna's divine body. So he has a form. Yes. There is no formless God. Oh, the formless God is the radiance of Krishna's body. Like, think about the sun and the sun light. So the sunlight, you know, you could say it's it's kind of formless, right? The light, but it emanates from the sun. So similarly, the formless God is established in Krishna. It's just the emanation of his own personality. So when we, when we um, love God, we will come to that emanation, that, that radiation? Is that what you call the bliss? Yeah, well, that, that's actually a lower attainment than if you were to just meet Krishna in person. You could do that? Yes. 
<laughs> See, why would you want to just merge into his formless radiance if you could meet him in person? So meeting him in person is a higher form of bliss than just merging into his so fullness. That's right. Get that. yeah. Yes. Uh, I have two part question about the soul. The soul is eternal, so can somebody improve the soul for the future births? You improve your mind. Improve your mind. Yes. The so mind is not going to go with the soul. It does. It does. Yes. In the, in the 15th chapter, Krishna tells that, that when the soul leaves, it takes the mind and senses with it. Just the physical body is left behind. And second part is, what are the ways or methods by which you can do that? Do or improve your mind? mind yeah. Attach it to Krishna. That's the easiest, all-encompassing method. And <laughs> just divert your desire for happiness towards Him. Start desiring Him and you'll get attached to Him. But something like meditation or... Yes, in fact that's a form of meditation is just thinking about Krishna's form and desire Him and feel like you're related to Him. That's, that's the meditation of the Gita which he describes in the sixth chapter. Yes. During Mahapralaya, as you said in the beginning of the Pravatan, that Maya stays in the dormant form. So, but it does not get destroyed, you know, Bhagavan cannot destroy it, as you said. That's right. So, what exactly is the nature of Maya, thing called Maya? Because, uh, at, but during Mahapralaya, everything is inactive, there's nothing going on. So, what, what is the nature of Maya? Does it exist separately from Bhagavan or the divine energy, or is it, is it an appendage? It's not very clear. It can exist independently, it only exists and functions through God's grace, you can say, God energizes it and it functions. Like a, te a television can operate on its own, you have to plug it in. So God is the one giving the power to Maya to be able to function and he also pervades Maya. So Maya is not independent from God, yet in terms of its characteristics and qualities, it's totally separate from God in that way, because God is perfect. God is unlimited bliss. This world has its nature of having good things in limitations, bad things in limitations, everything is temporary. It's like the exact opposite of God. So in terms of its characteristics, Maya is ungodly, and yet it's not independent from God. It's God's power. And you can't ask why is it like that because God didn't create it like that. Maya is an eternally existing energy. If God had created it, again, you could say, you know, is something wrong with your mind on that day that you created Maya? <laughs> why did you make it like that? He never made it. It's an eternally existing energy. Yes. Yeah, the soul doesn't need to get any message from the mind. Mind is trying to serve the soul because soul is the master of the mind. The soul is the master of the mind. Soul gives life to the mind. So the mind is just trying to serve the soul by finding happiness. That's it. But when a decision has to be made, you know, when you're faced, when you're in a situation in which, you know, you can either go two ways, either do the right thing or do the wrong thing, the final decision that you make is that just the mind that it, that yes, your mind does, does the thinking. Yeah. But don't think of it as two separate things because just like Maya can function without God, your mind can function without your soul. So your mind is not like a, a, a separate identity and then like your mind is doing one thing and your soul is doing another. The two are like if you pour water into milk, the two it's two separate things that are now soul joined together, you can't even tell them apart. It's like that. Mind and soul are together. So, soul uses the mind to think. Soul think of it that way. Yeah. Yeah.
Yes. <coughs> Krishna is eternal. But we have known Krishna in a certain point in history of humankind. Before that, we didn't know Krishna. You know, Rama doesn't mention Krishna. How is so? Well, he's there in the same scriptures. Yeah, but through the scriptures we know that he's eternal. He's always been there. No, we did know Krishna before 5,000 years ago. Because all the forms of God, the main dissensions, are described in the eternal scriptures. So no matter when, you could go back a million years or go back or go forward a million years, the same scriptures will be available and they'll be describing the same forms of God. And those same Krishna Leelas of Bhagavatam will be they were available a million years ago and they'll be available a million years from now. And Shri Krishna keeps descending. Yuga after yuga, he keeps coming in the world. And taking a different human form. Different forms, but he comes as Krishna also, at least once in one day of Brahma. So he comes repeatedly, even on, not even on other earth planets, of course, he's also descending. But even on our earth planet, he comes repeatedly. And now we have it on earth. Pardon me? Not with his peacock feather and flute, I can say, say that. Uh, in, the, in the Vedas, where do you find Krishna? Mention. In the Vedas. All over the Vedas. Samrasya Upanishad, Krishna Upanishad, Gopal, Tapaniya Upanishad, Radha Upanishad. Yes. That's right. It's there's a description later in the twelfth chapter of the like a comparison between trying to attach your mind to the formless God and trying to attach your mind to Krishna. And Krishna tells Arjun, it's me, either way you're attaching your mind to me, but attaching your mind to the formless God is nearly impossible for an ordinary person. You have to be already at a very highly evolved spiritual state in order to succeed in doing that. And an ordinary person needs a form. You can't love something formless. So there is a formless God and it's a higher stage of capacity. No, it's not higher. You have, it's more difficult. So you would already have to be at a very high level to even be able to do that. It doesn't mean that thing is higher. That thing is part of Krishna. But, but if you are already in a, a stage of being able to love God, it's the natural desire of the mind. In fact, we have so many examples, not just people who were following the path, but people who had actually attained formless God, but they were still here on this earth. And they decided, they, they kind of upgraded, you could say. And they, when they got a chance to experience the bliss of the personal form of God, then they just renounced that bliss of formless God. Like, there's examples of during Ram's dissension time, when King Janak, who was already absorbed in the bliss of formless God, he met Ram face to face. He said, my mind has just revoked that that bliss of formless God. Now I'm totally drowned in the love of Ram. There are many examples that happen like that with Ram and Krishna when they were on the earth planet, or even when they weren't on the earth planet, but such saints who were God realized, but with formless God, and through the grace of a higher saint who had attained the personal form of God, through the, that grace of that, that saint, they got that experience of the personal form of God.